Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to Thoroughgood's webcast entitled Data Visualization with ClickSense. My name is Corey Holtz, and I thank you for taking the time to join us today. I've been with Thoroughgood for eight years and am our organization's Click Capability Lead. I've worked with a number of our clients in areas including consumer goods and insurance. With me is Michael Van Son, one of our Click experts, who will be taking us through a few demonstrations. Mike is experienced in working with our customers in finance, insurance, and supply chain. Hello, everyone. We also have Kelsey Dietz, one of our Click certified consultants, with us today. If you have any questions during the event today, please drop your questions into the chat panel and direct them to the host. If we have time at the end of the event, we'll discuss them during the Q&A, and if not, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the event. Hi, Corey. Thank you. Today, we'll be taking you through a number of objectives. The first is to show how ClickSense caters to data-driven customers. Next, we'll be going to showcase the latest ClickSense 2.1 release and what it means for our customers. And finally, we'll conclude with how Click can deliver high-value solutions to the enterprise. With today's agenda, there are four main topic areas that we're going to discuss. Versatility, accessibility, flexibility, and the enterprise. We'll have a number of demonstrations today covering topics like financials, insurance markets, and an analysis of a consumer goods supply chain solution. Thoroughgood is a professional services firm specializing in business intelligence and analytics strategies, solutions, and services. We operate globally and have offices in the London, New York, Philadelphia, and Bangalore regions, and more information can be found on our website at www.thoroughgood.com. In speaking about our experience with Click, we are a Click Systems Integrator Partner and have been aligned with Click since 2009. We have delivered over 120 projects to our customers and specialize in the end-to-end -end integration of connecting Click with enterprise data systems to help companies get the most value of new and existing data in their organization. We wanted to highlight the industries and customers that Thoroughgood works with to deliver business insight and analytics solutions. Our customers are some of the leading organizations in the insurance, banking, consumer goods, pharma, and healthcare sectors, and we serve them globally with leveraged teams from our U.S., U.K., and India offices. There are currently two big product sets for Click at the moment. You have the tried-and-true ClickView program, now currently in version 11.2, and soon ClickView 12. Our customers use ClickView to develop and deploy right-guided analytics for exploration and discovery. And then there's ClickSense, now in the recently released 2.1 and the topic of today's conversation. It's a next-generation self-service data visualization application. With the latest version released just a few months ago, we wanted to highlight some of the newest features of the toolset and potential applications for our customers. On the left, we have a number of benefits of the Click set of tools. As you are evaluating different business intelligence tool sets, you might have a checklist of items that an enterprise tool should achieve to enable success in your organization. ClickView and ClickSense hit on a large number of must-haves for our enterprise customers, including visually driven analytics, blended data sources, and the ability to view applications both on desktop and on mobile devices. ClickSense was designed to be device agnostic, allowing for dynamic resizing to adapt to any device, whether it's a desktop or a laptop or a mobile device or a iPad. There are a number of items on the right to highlight some of the differentiators with ClickSense specifically that we'll cover today through discussions and through demonstrations. Versatility, accessibility, flexibility, and our enterprise focus. Now, let's talk about some of these latest technological offerings that have come with ClickSense 2.1. We wanted to highlight a list of new features that have been released as a part of version 2.1. Major items like the exploration menu, publishing to PowerPoint, and the integration of variables are ones that we're going to cover in some of our demonstrations today. And we figured the best way to highlight the latest features is to jump right into a demonstration of the tool. 
So at this point, I'll hand it over to Mike, who will give us our first demonstration. Thank you, Corey. So I'm going to speak to the versatility of ClickSense a little by showing a couple of different reports. And as we go through these reports, I'll call out some of those new features in ClickSense 2.1 that Corey just spoke about. So here I am in my ClickSense desktop hub, and I can see the different applications that I have available to me. These are applications that either I created or someone else created and shared with me. I'm going to start with the catastrophe dashboard that we have, and I'm going to assume a role at an insurance company. We have a, we have a data set um, with data for a wide variety of catastrophes from 2001 through 2015, and we have uh, data on the claims that came in against these catastrophes broken into the paid, their, paid amount, their paid amount and their outstanding amount. So I've opened the dashboard here, and I can see the different reports that we've created within this dashboard. I'm going to start with the executive dashboard. So this executive dashboard gives me things like a high-level view of some key numbers that I'm interested in tracking across time. So I have some of my paid claims, my total outstanding claims, uh, and my paid ratio. I have a tree map that's showing me how my total incurred claims uh, came in throughout the years. I have a bar chart over here breaking out my outstanding claims uh, against my different classes of business. Uh, and I also have a different view of my outstanding claims down here across time broken out by my underwriting divisions. So I like this line chart down here, uh, my different un underwriting divisions and how the outstanding claims have kind of risen and fallen across time. But I think it might look better with a couple tweaks. Something new in ClickSense 2.1 is that I do have some light interactivity available to me, even as I'm assuming kind of an executive role who doesn't necessarily want to go under the hood and edit the dashboard itself. So if I go into this, um, uh, if I go into this exploration menu here and I open it up, it'll expand the graph and it'll give me a few different options for making some, uh, some light changes to the dashboard. And we have, originally I had a line chart. I think it might look a bit better as an area chart. So I'm going to choose that, and I also want to see values on my data points instead of just the lines. So I'm going, to add, I'm going to add the values to my data points as well and show them. So I like this view a little bit better. I'm going to close out of my exploration menu, and you can see that the changes are then applied to my dashboard. Um, depending on my security profile and where this dashboard is being shared, I may or may not have the ability to keep these changes and actually apply them for other users. Um, in this case, I'm going to keep them. And I like this new view of the visualization. So I'm going to actually take a snapshot of it by clicking this camera up here, clicking the chart I want to take a snapshot of. It saves the snapshot. And we'll talk about where that snapshot was saved in the snapshot library, and uh, we'll return to it in a little bit. So um, this is a good high-level visualization. It shows me, uh, shows me some high-level numbers and some things I might be interested in as an executive. I'm now going to flip to a second report which we're calling our catastrophe comparison. So Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, and it was a pretty devastating event, of course. Um, we, our company wasn't uh, as quick to respond on the ground as we would have liked. When claims came in, we weren't as quick to address them um, and to analyze the claims as we would have liked. We took some corrective actions, and uh, moving forward, we want to see if those corrective actions have actually improved how we deal with events like Katrina. So we've used another new feature of ClickSense 2.1, uh, which is variables, to, uh, to hard code the left side of the screen to show only data for Hurricane Katrina. Those of you who are familiar with ClickView might be familiar with set analysis. Um, in set analysis, we've hard coded uh, the catastrophe of this left side to always be equal to a variable, which is Hurricane Katrina. Um, on the right side of the screen, we have the ability to make, to make some selections, search for other catastrophes, and choose a catastrophe that we want to compare to Katrina. So I know Ike was similarly devastating, so I'm going to go up to the catastrophe search bar here, and I'm going to search for Ike. My visualization has now changed to Ike on the right-hand side here. And what we see are a couple different things. For, current, for Hurricane Ike, my, um, my claims kind of came in a, a, with a smooth profile. They kind of rose over the first four or five months following the catastrophe. Um, they kind of plateaued after months five or six, and then they started to fall as we paid out those claims. Katrina, uh, in contrast, we, we see a little bit of a different picture. Our claims uh, kind of rose steadily months one through three following the event, but around months four or five here, we had a really sharp uptick in the rate at which claims came in. Uh, reason for this is likely because Katrina was actually so devastating that people took a little bit took a little while to get their livelihoods in order before they were actually able to file the claims. Um, 
So that's something interesting we can see from these visualizations. Again, then there was kind of the plateau and the outstanding claim amount started to fall as we began to pay out the claims, this blue line here. So I like these two visualizations side by side, and I also want to take snapshots of them to include in a quick view story, which we're going to show in a little bit. So again, I'll go up to my snapshot button, and I'll take snapshots of these two claims. We're going to take a snapshot of the one on the left and the one on the right. We're then going to move um, back to our app overview, where we saw all of our different reports. And we'll see on this app overview that in addition to seeing uh, three different reports that we have in this application, we also have the ability to view stories. So you can now see on the, um, here that I have my different reports, and I've taken snapshots of a couple of them within the executive dashboard. I now am going to click the Stories tab here. And we'll see a pre-created story that I've actually already created ahead of time. I'm going to open up that story, and we'll see again that these different visualizations that I took snapshots of, we, we pulled the different visualizations into a story and added them, to, um, added them to kind of this slide here. So my story has come up, the different visualizations I've created have come up. I've already put them in here, but just to, just to kind of show um, how you do them, when you, when you take a snapshot, it's stored to the snapshot library here. I click this little camera, my different snapshots will come up and I can drag and drop them as needed um, into my visualizations. I also have the ability to do things like adding text um, uh, or, uh, and, or to, if I want to add some commentary. So now that I have a story like this that I want to, that I want to show to people um, and I want to I maybe share in some different locations, I have a few different options. I can either share this ClickSense file um, and actually just share it with other people so other people can open up the story within ClickSense Desktop. I could, I could uh, share this to some centralized location to a ClickSense server so other people could access the server um, and open up this, this story within ClickSense server. Finally, uh, also new in ClickSense 2.1, something Corey mentioned, is that we can now take this story within ClickSense and export it to PowerPoint. So PowerPoint's a more traditional way of kind of sharing information with other people on your team or other people who might be interested in these visualizations but you might want to collate information from outside of ClickSense and within ClickSense. So we have the ability to use this drop-down menu to export the story to a PowerPoint. So here um, I have a few different options to select my resolution. I can click export. Um, that might take a little while to download, but I'm just going to flip to a PowerPoint where I actually have the story exported, and it'll look just like this. I'll just put it into a PowerPoint slide. Um, so, then I, and then, so then I could pull in information from outside of ClickSense, maybe add a couple additional slides, and create a PowerPoint deck with information from ClickSense. I'm going to pass back to Corey now, who's actually integrated this slide into his ClickSense deck. All right, thanks, Mike. So summarizing what we saw from the latest release and the demo that Mike just did, ClickSense now has integrated variables. We've been able to take advantage of this by creating a dynamic comparison, allowing our business community to compare to a known benchmark. We've also used the exploration menu to dynamically change visualizations without having to go into the edit menu, giving our front end users and our business more flexibility. And finally, we took advantage of exporting of stories into PowerPoint to create the slide that you see here that we've now integrated into our PowerPoint deck. So next we're going to be talking about accessibility with ClickSense. Now, when putting together applications that are delivered to the business community, it is vitally important to have a view of who is consuming the data and what business decisions are being made. We've highlighted three different types of business users here. Executives, who need high-level summaries and perhaps some light interactivity. They need to be able to see the big picture quickly and often will task others to finding out more. Managers are a classification of users who might be in charge of a particular business area or capability. They have a set of goals, and their applications should support achieving those goals. For example, maybe hitting a particular target percentage, getting a view of the constituent members within their business unit. They need well-designed views, and they need problem areas highlighted quickly and efficiently. Our last group are analysts. They are your heavy-hitting data group who are often doing activities to support greater reporting tasks. 
They're the ones who you hope are doing exploratory analysis of the data to hunt down the details of a problem and have the ability to answer any data question that comes up. Often time, though, these users are spending large amounts of time gathering, manipulating, and cleansing data, which hardly leaves any time at all to explore the insights that might be hiding between the lines of your spreadsheets. So, to demonstrate this, we have a few other demonstrations that Mike's going to take through, catering to different types of business users. Thanks, Corey. So, I'm going to flip back to ClickSense desktop here and I'm going to return to my app overview of our catastrophe dashboard. I'm going to go back to my different reports and reopen this executive dashboard that we are seeing. So I had that selection made on Hurricane Ike, so right now all my data is reflecting Hurricane Ike. I'm going to clear that selection. Again, we go back to my high-level executive dashboard view. So now um, it's great that I can see these high-level numbers, but I'm going to now assume the role of a mid-level manager who's interested in viewing data for maybe a specific uh, one or two classes of business, and understanding uh, some of the information behind the outstanding claims within those two classes of business. So I'm going to look at my two uh, greatest classes of business here, my property and ca casualty lines. I'm going to make selections on those two. We can see all the KPIs and all the visualizations updated to reflect those selections. I'm going to click the green check mark to apply those selections, and now they'll apply in other reports that I've created in the dashboard. So I'm going to click this right arrow here to move to that second report in my dashboard, which is kind of a mid-level manager view. Again, in this report, we have some high-level KPIs. We have a percent of claims that are closed within my, percent, within my property and casualty lines. We show a build of my property and casualty uh, incoming claims over time, which of course have grown as my property and casualty business has grown. And then down in the lower half of the sheet, we have some information on my subclasses of business. So I'm going one level down uh, in my product hierarchy. And on the left here, I have uh, a scatter plot where each point represents a subclass within property and casualty. So on the x-axis on the scatter plot, I have the number of claims incoming for, uh, for each subclass. And on the y-axis, I have the total amount of claims that are outstanding uh, in dollar values um, for all of those claims. The color of each dot represents, uh, gives me a sense of what percentage of the claims are closed within that subclass. So I'm interested in this visualization, but in particular, I'm interested in this upper left-hand quadrant here, where I don't have a lot of claims coming in against these subclasses, but the monetary value of these claims is pretty great. So I'm going to use the lasso tool here to make some selections on that quadrant. I'm going to specifically select just a few. I'm going to, uh, as, I, as I draw a rough circle around those, it'll make selections on everything that I encapsulated. I'm going to hit the green check mark to apply those changes. Now, just to zoom in a little, I'm also going to expand the chart. So these are some subclasses that I'm interested in. Uh, subclass XCI is in, particularly, is in particular interesting to me. Not a lot of claims coming in against it, but a really high outstanding amount, and this dark red color uh, rep, uh, reflects that we have a large percentage of claims within this subclass that we're not paying out. So if I return to my view, I also have a tabular version of, of, the, uh, of the data here. I can sort all my selected subclasses by their paid ratio, and again, I can see that subclass XCI uh, is only paying out about 32% of its claims. So this might be an area where, um, where I need to go to the product line lead responsible for subclass XCI and try to, um, try to find out a little information. Why aren't we paying claims there? Um, what, uh, what, about the, what, what about the nature of those claims that doesn't allow us to pay them out, and maybe we need to take some corrective action? So we've seen um, in the last two demos, we've seen kind of a high-level executive dashboard, a mid-level view, and uh, a comparative analysis dashboard that an analyst might use um, within the insurance industry. I'm going to kind of switch gears now and assume the role of someone within the CPG industry, and we have a data set of uh, consumer packaged goods data that we're, going to, that we're going to do a similar breakdown of visualizations with. So if I return to my ClickSense desktop hub, I'm going to now open my inventory analysis dashboard. This dashboard is built on top of a data set um, of customer order quantities, uh, as well as the uh, inventory on hand that I have um, in my different suppliers around the world to meet those orders. So again, I'm first going to open this executive dashboard. And within this executive dashboard, I'm going to make a selection so that I'm only viewing data um, as of my most recent month. The suppliers that I have in this data have latitude and longitude data available with it 
uh, in them uh, within, within the data set. So I'm able to actually create a map and map my suppliers around the world. I'm going to zoom in on Europe here, and we've, we've coded this visualization so that, the, so that the color and the size of the bubbles represents kind of the stock stop gap between the customer orders that are coming in uh, and the stock that we have on hand at these different suppliers to meet those orders. So right away at a high level, I can see that I have a couple problem areas where I might need to take some corrective action. I have suppliers in Spain, one in Italy, one in Belgium, uh, where there's a large gap between what we have, between the inventory we have on hand and the orders that we need to fulfill. So I might need to decide, do we need to ramp up production in those areas? Um, do we need to reallocate some of our supply? But I can't really see, um, I can't really see kind of the brands or the specific materials that we might need to take action on. So that's where I might, that's where as a mid-level manager, I might need some more detailed information. So we could also create a mid-level manager view for this, for this report. And I'm going to actually start to do that, but I'm going to do it from scratch instead of showing a pre-created report. So I'm going to go to my app overview and create a new sheet. I'm going to call it uh, out of stock report, OS report. If I just open this report, we have a blank sheet now. I'm going to start to create some visualizations, and I'm interested to see who my top customers are first. So if I hit the edit button here, I'm going to create a bar chart. I'm going to add customer code as my dimension on this bar chart. I'm just going to add a measure for the total order quantity coming in against each of those customers. And right away I can see who my top customers are. Uh, I can see I have a lot of customers down here. The scroll bar on the bottom gives me a sense of how big my chart actually is. It tails off pretty quickly. So maybe I'm only interested in seeing uh, my top 15 customers. So I'm just going to show my top 15 customers in the formatting settings over here. You can see uh, as a default, ClickSense gives you the, an others bar, which sums up all the other uh, customers that aren't included in the top 15. I'm not going to show that others bar right here. So I get a sense of who my top 15 customers are, but I want to add a little more information to this chart to make it a little more interesting and insightful. Also within my data, I have a flag which flags each customer order as either low stock or out of stock um, at, uh, at the relevant supplier. So I'm going to pull this flag onto my data as well. I'm just going to add a second dimension, my out of stock, low stock flag. You can see by default, ClickSense has created a a uh, grouped bar chart for me is grouping uh, each of these different customers by out of stock, in stock, or low stock. I think this would look a little better as a stack bar chart, so I'm going to change it to a stack bar chart. I also want to sort my customers now so that they're sorting by total orders. So I'm going to go into my sorting menu here in ClickSense. I'm going to sort my customer codes. Instead of auto sorting, I'm going to sort by an expression. So here I'm just going to type an expression. For those of you who are familiar with ClickD, you may be familiar with the syntax. I'm going to sort by my customer order quantity. It'll auto-fill the field for me. I'll apply that change. I want to view them in descending order. And now I've created a pretty useful visualization. It shows me my top customers, uh, and it shows me uh, for the orders that they're sending us, how, many, uh, how, ma how much of those orders are out of stock or low stock, because that can be opportunities where we're kind of missing out on opportunity. We could also do other things to, uh, to this report. We could add filters. Um, so maybe I want to add a date filter so that I allow my users to, uh, to make a selection on a certain date. So I'm going to add a, uh, I'm going to add my month year filter here. Um, we could resize these filters to give us additional, these filters and charts to give us additional space to add other visualizations. But I actually have a more finished version of this report that I'm going to flip to now instead of building the whole thing. So I'm going to flip to this uh, report that we're calling our out-of-stock analysis. And here again, I have that same visualization I just created. Um, I, have, I have all my different customers. I have my date filter. But we've also added a little more information. Uh, we've added a top suppliers chart down here, a KPI for our percent stocked within all, within all of our selections. Um, and we also have a chart down here that's kind of giving us a tabular view of the total orders coming in for our uh, broken out by our brands. So again, some customers kind of jump out at me in this chart. Um, I'm interested in this customer in particular right here, one of my five top customers, but there's a significant gold portion of that bar, which means that there's a significant amount of orders that are coming in from that customer that are out of stock. Um, I'm going to apply that selection. I can see down here in my suppliers chart, uh, this chart is designed to uh, highlight the suppliers where there are a significant amount of out-of-stock orders coming in. So I'm interested in uh, orders from this customer coming in against these two suppliers, so I'm going to select those. 
And again, my tabular chart here is now changing to reflect the selections I've made. So these are the brands that this customer is ordering, but these, but these suppliers uh, really aren't able to fill. There's a lot of out-of-stock uh, order quantities at, for these different brands. So these might be brands where I have to, I have to make some decisions. Do I ramp up production of them? Uh, do I actually do I reallocate some of my supply, or do I choose a different supplier to supply these customer orders so that I don't miss out on the opportunity? We've also um, we've also added kind of a second report showing similar data, but in a more traditional tabular sense. So something that a lot of users will like is be able to see the high level visualizations. But once they've made a lot of selections, they want to be able to see the data in a more uh, in kind of a grid form, a more traditional tabular format. So we've added this here so they can actually see the breakout of brands and the necessary materials within that brand um, and, and kind of what our stock gap is for the different materials. So I showed a, an executive dashboard here. I've showed a view that a mid-level manager might like. We also have a, a, a report that I might use if I assume the role of an analyst. But before we show that, I'm going to flip back to Corey, who's going to talk about flexibility within ClickView a little bit. Thank you, Mike. So let's talk about how ClickSense can deliver the flexibility that you need for your business community. So one of the areas that our customers have seen success with Click Projects is the flexibility of our data model. Now think about the data that exists within your organization. How are people consuming different types of data? On the screen, we've represented different pieces of data into general categories. On the left would be ad hoc data maybe one-time extracts that you import in the hopes of getting insight, but might end up throwing away quickly. Normally, our customers are analyzing things like one-time extracts, market data, in tools like Excel. On the right, you have your traditional managed data. These are the robust, stable processes with assured quality, like, say, an underwriting system or a supply chain database. Most likely, your organization is working with some form of properly managed data stores, and Click works great in connecting and reporting with this type of data. But what if you wanted to pilot a quick mashup between outside market data with your financial databases? You could do that quickly with ClickSense to prove value and gain insight. The problem, though, is that we want you find value in those one-time extracts in your ad hoc extracts, but want to get it into your data warehouse. Oftentimes, these processes take exorbitant amounts of time to get a data warehouse in place. However, the business might be finding insight now, so what do you do? Our customers have seen success with an agile data store which sits in the middle. We've helped customers build up repositories using Click that can have process control in place but are still flexible enough to meet the changing needs of your business. So talking about one of our customers, a global insurance organization, who was looking to find value in broker and market data. First, we conducted a proof of concept utilizing data in the ad hoc space. We did a simple one-time data load, and within a few hours, we had some basic visualizations and worked with the business community to see would this broker data be providing value. The data was not in their traditional data warehouse, and the migration project to get it into the managed space there on the right was going to take a long time. So instead of making the business community wait to get value out of this information, we were able to quickly build an agile zone for them where the broker data could be brought in via Excel files, merged with the traditional data warehouse, and value was provided to the business community while a parallel project was kicked off to move that data into the traditional data warehouse permanently. You can get data into ClickSense in days or weeks versus having to wait months or even years in a traditional data warehouse and still have it be robust enough to support enterprise processes. The beauty of Click is that it can be made to work with any data source, and as your underlying data changes, Click projects are able to quickly adapt thanks to a very powerful and flexible scripting engine. So speaking of that scripting engine, on the screen now we have a list of extensibility options for Click. What we've been showing you so far has been the base version of ClickSense. Now ClickSense can be extended from that base version to do more and integrate with other tool sets. Now, what if you wanted to embed ClickSense into web pages, SharePoint, .NET applications? What if you want to do your own custom visualizations beyond what's offered in the base version of ClickSense? The tool sets listed here help provide an expansion to Click capabilities to make it work with whatever your particular business needs are. And the value in extensions is that they could be open source. 
You can have people creating, collaborating, and contributing in the same way that other open source technologies work. So if any of the topics listed here are of interest to you, drop us a note in the chat panel and we'll be sure to follow up. And we're going to go back to a demonstration where Mike's going to highlight this flexibility and extensibility, um, but also start to talk about what it means for our enterprise customers. Thanks, Corey. I'm going to flip back to ClickSense here. And again, so we, we talked through an executive dashboard view and a, uh, a mid-level manager view. Um, in my, in my last demo here, I'm going to show, show a view that we'd use for an ad hoc analyst who's interested in diving a little bit deeper into the data. So I'm going to move one report to my right, and I'm going to clear all the selections I made in my last demonstration. So what we have on the right here, this nice visualization, it's called a Stenky diagram. Some of you may be familiar with it. But what it's showing is my different uh, supplier regions on the left, my different customer regions on the right. And the bar, uh, the size of the bar connecting each supplier region and each customer region is uh, indicative of the total order quantity coming uh, that is meant to be supplied from supplier X uh, to customer Y. So, uh, so why this report is actually interesting to me is if, I, if, I'm, looking at, if I'm interested in looking at my different out-of-stock events and where they're occurring, I'm especially interested to see where I have out-of-stock events um, in locations where I have intercontinental orders. So if, if we have products shipping from Europe to North America and a lot of those, and we have a lot of out-of-stock events occurring for those orders, those might be areas where I pretty quickly need to address them and take some corrective action so that we don't have customers who are, first of all, disappointed by uh, the lag time associated with out-of-stock events, but then also have to wait for the increased shipping times associated with intercontinental orders. So Stenky diagrams are useful for things like that, but they aren't native in, uh, in, Cl in ClickSense. ClickSense has a set number of visualizations that you can use out of the box, but we can use extensions to kind of exp expand upon those visualizations that are available to us. So what we did here is we found a Stenky diagram extension. We placed it in the correct directory underlying our ClickSense dashboard. And if you go into edit mode here, in addition to those other visualizations we saw before when we were creating the bar chart, we also have a uh, Sense Sankey extension, it's called, which allows us to just drag and drop it under our, onto our report like we do other visual, visualizations, and then we can add uh, dimensionality and measures and things like that. So I'm going to return back to my dashboard. Uh, so now maybe I'm interested in looking at uh, orders that are coming in from North America. So I'm going to make a North America selection uh, on my customer sector. And we can see from my Senki diagram that my North American and European suppliers are, for the most part, the ones responsible for supplying these North American orders. Uh, I'm also going to view data just for my most recent date here. I'm going to just view data for August, which is my most recent date. And we can also see that I have a scatter plot in the bottom left that's adjusting um, as I make all these selections. On the scatter plot, uh, each each point represents a different brand. We have three different colors representing our different brand groups within our company. Uh, but the x-axis of the scatter plot gives us a sense of the gap between the orders that are coming in and the inventory that we have on hand. We've created a measure called our over-understocked ratio. We don't really want points to fall too far to the right of this graph because that means we're very overstocked or we have inventory on hand that we probably don't really need. But even more importantly, we really don't want points to fall uh, to the left of this graph. The y-axis on this graph represents total order quantities that are coming in. So where we have points where there's a significant order quantity coming in uh, and it falls on the left-hand side of this x-axis, meaning we're understocked on them, those are data points where we're really missing out on opportunity. That means the orders are really coming in, but we can't meet all of them. So I'm going to, again, expand this chart. I'm going to use my lasso, lasso tool again to kind, of, to kind of select some of the data points that I'm really interested in viewing more data for. So again, I can just wrap around and I can view some of the brands that are falling in that quadrant that I'm interested in. These are the brands where I really need to, um, I really need to think about how I'm supplying them. Do we need to ramp up production or, uh, or do we need to actually fulfill, the, fulfill, fulfill these orders from different suppliers? So again, in this dashboard, I've used a Senki diagram, not native within ClickSense, but I've gone out and used an extension to give me some visibility into my data that I wouldn't otherwise have. One last piece of this whole dashboard, this whole consumer packaged goods dashboard in general that I want to show before I pass back to Corey, is how we actually loaded in this data and created the data model on, on which we're building these different visualizations. 
So we've seen the application overview, um, which shows me my different reports. I'm going to go one down here in my navigation menu and go to my data manager. So my data manager lists the different data sources that I've loaded in. I'm just going to give it a second to load here. And uh, just to kind of give a sense of how easy it is to add data to your data model, I'm just going to click the Add Data button here, and I'm going to create a new connection. I know my SPAC files are in Excel files. They're flat data sources. So I'm going to select an Excel uh, file connection type. I'm going to go to a directory where I know my fact files live. Then I'm going to select the fact file that I want to, that I want to view within ClickSense. As I open it, ClickSense will load in the metadata and give me a preview of the data that's available in that fact file. So I can see the different column names are added here. I can choose to add or remove them from my data model with check marks. I could do things like specify the header size of my data source. And once I have the data as I like it, I could just press load and finish, and ClickSense would load this data into my data model without having to do any scripting or anything. I'm going to close out of this and not actually load it because, because we've already loaded this fact file into our data. But you can see here I've loaded this Excel source into my data. I've also added some data from SQL to give me uh, some more information on my dimensionality, to give, me, to give me some information on my customer geography, my brands, things like that. And as I've loaded in these different tables, what ClickSense has been doing has actually been creating a data model behind the scenes. So as I load in my fact file and my dimension, and my dimension files that have uh, similar field names, just like in ClickView, associations will be implicitly made between tables that have common field names. To view that data model that's being created, I can go to my data model viewer here. And it's going to open up a view of my different tables that I've loaded in for my different Excel sources and SQL sources. You can see I have my fact table at the middle here that I loaded in from Excel. I also have my different dimension tables. And again, just like uh, if you're familiar with ClickView, these associations have been made between my fact table and my dimension tables without having to explicitly call them out. So now if I make a selection on something like my brand group name, my fact, my fact data will be filtered to only show the relevant brands. One last piece of data modeling within ClickSense that I want to call out uh, for those of you who are interested in using some of the flexibility that comes with ClickView scripting is even though we've, we've done this data modeling to this point without actually doing any ClickView scripting, we do, have, uh, we do have that script interface available to us in the data load editor. So if you go into the data load editor, you can see that ClickSense is behind the screens, actually behind the scenes, has actually been developing a script based on the data files you've loaded in. And you can edit that if you want to. If there are pieces of code that you can't get uh, implemented just in the normal data load manager, you can come into this mode and do a little more uh, custom coding. So uh, with all of that, I'm going to pass back to Corey, and he's going to talk about how creating a data model within ClickSense can kind of help you uh, with Click in the enterprise environment. All right. Thank you, Mike. So in our final section, a brief discussion on the enterprise. What we have listed on the screen here is a project approach that we've seen our customers have success with Click projects. Because Click provides such a robust set of tools, instead of a simple linear approach to requirements, development, and delivery, you can bring versatility and iteration to your projects and build stages to ensure that you are understanding and addressing the business goals of a Click project. Think about a normal project where maybe you've missed a key piece of data or a required calculation. Usually there's a large upstream and downstream effect that might prevent you from addressing it without major changes and delays. Because Click is such an agile tool, our clients have found real value in being able to quickly pivot to take advantage of new data, new business insights, and deliver more rapidly real integrated value with the business community to deliver a final solution. Mike was highlighting very briefly there, we've taken data from, uh, from a database source and now we're mashing it up to local data that we have. Our customers find real value in that. And when you hit the finish line, you can start up iterative feedback to quickly develop and define new objectives to improve on existing systems or move on to new business objectives. A few notes about an example click architecture. Now, again, this is a simple diagram. Click architectures are certainly not one size fits all, but we want to show one example where our customers have found success. So this flowchart represents an end-to-end -end process of getting your data from the data sources into ClickSense. And it's broken down into a few sections. The data layer consists of taking the data from your source systems and putting them into a cohesive data model. Sometimes these are known as click marts. Then you have your front-end visualizations on the top here that tap into those data models. 
Now, the layers are separate in this model because what it allows for is data reusability, governance of data, multiple developers working cohesively on the same system, and enterprise maintainability. So I want to pause for a second to talk about the data models specifically. If you are a current ClickView user, you may have models in place that might be complicated. And as Mike showed, in the ClickSense application, the model is more exposed to your business community so that they can build their own applications from scratch. You'll want to give more focus to the usability of your data models than you might have in the past, and we at Thoroughgood can help you with that conversation and potential conversion. So we love Click. We think they have a great set of products. However, again, how do you make it work for the enterprise? We just spoke about some considerations of data modeling, and the main process that we help our enterprise customers with is getting it right when it comes to the expansion and the adoption of Click implementations. We've thrown up a few sample questions here on what our enterprise customers think about when it comes to Click. When it comes to your applications, you need to think about the business goals, the audience, and how Click applications are going to help you deliver on those goals. Pair that with the architecture side and how can you design your data stores to deliver real value but still be flexible enough to adapt to ever-changing business needs. We've had projects where we guide customers on designing adaptive master data and extraction processes to build up those standard data repositories for future projects. We've also worked in adding in very flexible functionality to build on an already robust front end, for example, some of the extension objects that Mike had shown today. To summarize, what we hope that we've shown you today is how ClickSense caters to data-driven customers. Um, we also showed ClickSense 2.1's release and what it means for our customers and some of those new and interesting features. Finally, we concluded with Click and delivering high-value solutions to the enterprise. How can Thoroughgood help? On the screen now are a number of services that we provide to our customers. Some recent examples include building out a strategy for Click tools for a global enterprise organization and how they can plan and expand their footprint for data growth now that they've recently finished a major acquisition. We also have an ongoing user enablement and training program for an insurance client which is helping them put more power in the hands of the data consumer. If any of the topics above are of interest to you, reach out to us via the chat panel and we'll be more than happy to discuss further. We hope that you found today's event interesting. There are a number of on-demand videos on our website, and we have a number of topics related to both ClickView and ClickSense. And you can also hear and see where our customers are finding success with the Click set of tools in our case study section. And here's a schedule of our upcoming events. You can register for these events on our website or watch any of our on-demand videos at www.thoroughgood.com events. So we are near the end of time here. However, there are a number of good questions that have come up. So the three of us are going to stay on the line here for a few more minutes and answer any questions that come through the chat panel, in addition to uh, answering some of the questions that have come through. Um, Kelsey, is there uh, anything, in, anything interesting that has come across on the chat panel? Sure. So we have one basic question here um, that we can answer in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we currently only have ClickView. How difficult is it to upgrade to ClickSense? Um, well, it's actually very simple. Uh, on Click.com, ClickSense Desktop is available for free to download, so you can actually upgrade right away. It doesn't take that long. Just go to Click.com, and you can download that free desktop version. And I think that there's a larger conversation at play, too, Kelsey, for our enterprise customers are going to potentially have lots of applications that exist within ClickView. If you're considering ClickSense, ClickSense is not meant to be a replacement of ClickView. And so there are lots of things that you should be considering are how complicated are your applications, how recyclable is the data model that you have in place currently, and what are the merits of using ClickSense versus ClickView. And we think that it's, it's very good to engage with um, individual discussions with our customers about how they should be upgrading which candidates and which, I'm sorry, which applications are good candidates it's for, for upgrading. Any other questions, Kelsey? Uh, sure. So we have another question that came in uh, asking, uh, are we able to do merging queries? Merging queries. That's interesting. Uh, Mike, are you able to bring up the, the data model that you were showing yes. again at the 
um, on that final demonstration there. So uh, you might be used to traditional data stores where if you want to be combining data sources, you might have, say, either a left join or some sort of join query that combines data together. So Mike, um, you've got back on the screen here, has combined a number of different data sources together. But if you show the model, Mike, on how it comes together, one of the beauties of the, the click set of projects, the click scripting engine, is that if you have two separate tables, and the table names are called the same thing, it's going to create a join for you. So we actually find it fairly inefficient to do join scripts. Those are possible in, in ClickView and ClickSense, but it's better to let the natural scripting engine make those connections for you. And actually, Mike, could you zoom in and we can highlight, again, just emphasizing one of the things that Mike said before, customer country code, supplier country code. We've got these links here that are naturally defined by the scripting engine, and, and ClickView and ClickSense can take the most advantage of it by joining your data together this way in the cohesive associative engine instead of uh, doing some sort of massive join query that you might do in a traditional warehouse or in a traditional view. Kelsey, um, other questions? Yeah, so there was another question about one of the new features of ClickSense 2.1, and that's how can I create variables in ClickSense? Variables, Mike. Yep, sure. So if we go into any of our dashboards uh, that we've been editing, and we go into the edit mode, which we've seen in a couple of different demonstrations, uh, we have a we have a whole variables interface where we can um, we can cr here are variables that we're using within here. You can see the Hurricane Katrina variable that we used in our demo earlier, but you can create a new one, and similar to ClickView, you can give the variable a name, define use uh, use typical ClickView uh, function language to write the definition of that variable. You can give it a description, tags. Tags are actually new to ClickSense, not in ClickView, but they allow you to group different items together um, by some metadata piece. Uh, so it's very similar to how you would create variables in ClickView. And then these variables are going to be available to you after you've created them. Uh, you, can then, you can then pull them onto your sheet um, just like you would uh, any other, like a dimension or a measure. And Mike, one thing I think is very interesting about this, so a variable doesn't have to be hard-coded to a specific value. Mm -hmm. If you think about our catastrophe application, we hard-coded Hurricane Katrina specifically here, mm -hmm. but I see that we've got a function button within the definition. Yeah. This means that we have the ability to define a function to have a dynamically changing variable based on inputs or based on some other type of function. Sure. Uh, Corey, there was a question asked about that, actually. So if we can click on that function icon, um, anytime you see that function icon, uh, you're able to write functions and expressions. So someone asked, you know, where can we write functions and expressions? Any place that you see that FX icon down in the bottom right-hand corner or on the right-hand side um, of your input pane, you can enter uh, functions and expressions. So you could do something like an if statement like you had in ClickView. Um, so maybe if you wanted a flag or something, you could use an if statement. All the, all the same kind of uh, expressions are available for you to use. And you can add fields, actually, just by searching your different fields over here on this interface on the right. And so, so Mike, in the base version of ClickView, we have fields, right? And mm -hmm. so fields, but there's this added concept of exposing the data model to our business community where it's extended to dimensions and measures. Mm -hmm. And so, could you show us the creation of a custom measure? Now, in ClickSense, we've got the base version, so you can do sums and averages and easy things that you can pick up, or you can you know, type in a measure in this, uh, in this interface, but um, can you show us the master items and creating a measure that I can then reuse throughout the entire application? Yeah, so ClickSense has this concept of master items which are items that you create within ClickSense and are available to use within all of your reports within a given dashboard. So um, master items can be things like dimensions or measures. But I find them particularly useful for measures. So what we've done here is we've actually created some master items uh, that we've been using uh, in, the, in these different visualizations. So we've done things like paid ratio, where we've defined a calculation uh, using, again, a ClickView function. Um, and this is basically taking uh, uh, taking our paid claims, dividing them by, by our total claims incurred to give us our paid ratio. And we now have this, me this measure, this master item, available to use um, on this visualization 
or on any of the other reports that we were creating within the supply chain dashboard. Yeah, and I, and I think it goes back to the emphasis on the data model and having a good data model in place. If you, uh, the beauty of ClickSense is that you can expose a whole series of users who may not be used to a visual analytics tool. But what this gives control in this master item section, take advantage of complex scripting capabilities and also take, a, you know, integrating set analysis into things like your master items where a brand new user to, to click view or click sense may not have a good sense of something like set analysis. But if you have a group in place, a power user group that's creating some of these key master items, that makes it a lot simpler for your end user community to take advantage of some scripts that other people have written. So the next question that we had that came in was, um, what sort of data volume are we talking about here? Uh, for example, would it be feasible to um, bring in a data source that had 100 million records with 200 columns? So I would think 100 million rows is certainly very feasible. I think that there is a lot to be said about um, the type of data that's coming in as well. The ClickView scripting engine, what it attempts to do, it is attempts to do uh, columnar storage and compress based on the uniqueness of the data that's coming in. A very brief example, let's say that you were to have a date time field. A date time field is probably going to be fairly unique if you have that over 100 million rows, but if you were to break that out into a date field and a time field, it does a unique uh, a unique check against all of the members within the column itself. So it could easily take in 100 million rows if you have some good data modeling principles in place to break it down. Uh, they mentioned 200 columns here, and I think it's, I guess it's a question of where are those 200 columns coming in? Do you have 200 fact columns that are coming in? Do you have 200 unique measures that are coming in? Might be a bit unwieldy in an application. But are those 200 columns that maybe are attributes of, say, dimensionality, whether it's a product or a customer, perhaps you break those out in more of a traditional star schema. So a lot of consideration. I would think 100 million rows is certainly pretty feasible. And again, it just depends on, on how you want to make your data model work. Um, then we have another question that came in. Uh, can we create tabular reports? And can we create breaks and sections in those reports? So tabular, um, but Mike had an example up where he had gotten to a very fine grain level, uh, made some selections, and we were looking at just a straight table. Um, so if you're if you're used to uh, click view vernacular, straight table is the way that we would look at that. Mike, do you have that yeah. uh, in the inventory application? So something relatively new, wasn't new in 2.1, I believe it was new in 2.0, was a pivot table. And so we have, you know, I'm used to a, a Microsoft tool to give you an example, reporting services where you can program in line breaks and section breaks. Because everything is meant to be consumed within the screen here, what we have within the screen is everything listed. Now Mike has a number of different um, dimensions that are here, group, uh, group name, brand name, and material code. Now Mike, we're looking at just a, a straight table right now, aren't we? Yeah, so this is just a straight table, no pivoting or anything going on here. And so if you wanted to, you could take advantage of a pivot table. Would it break onto a separate page? No, it wouldn't do that, but we would hope that you could take advantage of things like filtering and whatnot to break it down to the sections that you want. Something that we didn't talk about today was Click's recent acquisition of a tool called nPrinting. Now, nPrinting was a third-party software that was meant to help give you more traditional tabular formatted reports that came via ClickView sources. With that integration of nPrinting, uh, Click themselves are working on, okay, how do we make this work seamlessly with Click View? But what we're hoping in terms of the future pipeline is that something like nPrinting, more properly formatted tabular reports that you might want to put to a printer or put to a PDF, will soon come along in ClickSense. However, that capability doesn't really exist today. Uh, sure, so we have another question. If ClickSense is not a replacement, um, yet, quick view based on older technologies like the VD scripting engine and ActiveX control. Uh, what is the vendor? What is Click doing to to address this? So if I understand right, you know, ClickView, uh, version 11.2, uh, kind of a, a fairly old engine at this point, whereas ClickSense is, you, okay, hey, this is the new scripting engine and this is the way forward. ClickView 
12, which should be released relatively soon from the guidance that we're getting from the vendor, um, is a rebuilding of the scripting engine underneath. And so what they call it is the QIX engine, the Quix engine. And what that is, is that's the engine that's driving ClickSense, so the new technology taking advantage of everything related to ClickSense. What ClickView 12 is, is a rebuilding of the engine underneath to take advantage of that, that, that QIX engine, that Quix engine. This will allow for both technologies to be based off the same underneath, uh, underlying engine underneath. And what, well, what we're hoping here at Thoroughgood to see is the integration of some of those open source extensibility options through the open APIs and the SDKs to move forward with ClickView on the same technological platform that ClickSense is meant to be on moving forward. So I see that we're at the top of the hour here. Um, Kelsey, were there more questions that came in? Uh, I think any other questions that we have, we'll be sure to follow up with you Great. Uh, after. Okay, all right. So we'd like to thank everyone for taking the opportunity to join us today. On behalf of myself, Mike, and Kelsey, um, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.